very honoured to be one of the co-hosts of the Incheon Distinguished Lecture Series, um, which is set up and sponsored by Kuchi in honour of um, Suji's founder and her mentor on the show. So, um, and these lecture series are theories in the ether, as it were, and then also physically different universities in the network, and they address themes relevant to contemporary Buddhism. Um, what we would um, like to do today is um, first introduce our speaker, um, have the talk, and then have questions, but the uh, material will also go online afterwards if people want to send questions later as well. Uh, to introduce our speaker, um, University of Oxford's Professor of Chinese Philosophy, Good afternoon. Um, it is my great honor to introduce Professor Harry Brock today. Um, I first encountered Hal's writing when I was a graduate student myself, and um, I was immediately struck by the clarity and the rigor of Hal's writing, and it came to be a source of inspiration for me, but not just as a matter of the past, it still continues to be inspirational as now my hair is turning gray myself, and I teach Chinese philosophy at this university, Harold, and his work continues to be a great source of inspiration. Hal is professor of Chinese studies and the director of the Contemplative Initiative at Brown University, specializing in religious thought of early China, broadly defined. It seems to me Hal can write faster than most of us read. His works include books such as the Textual History of the Finances, Original Tao, Inward Training and Foundations of Taoist Mysticism, Taoist Identity, Cosmology, Lineage and Ritual, A Cosmology to Angus Grain's Bronze, The Finance, A Guide to the Theory and Practice of Governance in Early China, The Essential Finance, The Contemplative Foundations of Classical Taoism. Hal has moreover published 50 articles or so in book chapters or in, in um, as book chapters or in journals on various aspects um, covering historical or religious matters of Taoist traditions, as well as on the pedagogy and the academic discipline of contemplative studies, and moreover on uh, textual history and textual criticism of early classical works in the Chinese context. For personal reasons, I'd like to highlight his work on methodological aspects in the study of the Maozi, the Gordian manuscripts, which uh, to me as a PhD student, uh, PhD student was an eye-opener of academic prose, exceptional in clarity and rigor. Professor Roth is credited with coining the term contemplative studies, and he's best known today probably for his work on religious, spiritual aspects of Chinese thought. But to me, he remains outstanding as a scholar for his rare quality of bringing Chinese texts to life by way of fine philological analysis, portraying the deeper aspects of religious philosophical thought of early China. So I believe I've probably taken enough of your time and you'd rather hear Professor Roth speak. So without further ado, I'd please like you to welcome Harry Roth. Hal, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Meyer, for that um, undeservedly uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, I very much appreciate your comments and I appreciate your work as well. Um, I want to thank Professor Crosby for organizing this and Dr. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Sarah Shaw and the Suji Charity Foundation for the support of this. So I will probably get up and down as uh, as time goes on in the lecture, and I'm going to stick fairly closely uh, to the to the slides uh, because I tend to wander and, and tell stories, and then uh, I, don't, uh, I wander away from what I have intended to do. Plus, I think it's easier for the translators 
to have uh, this written uh, these written slides. But um, uh, please uh, feel free to either uh, look at the slides or just to close your eyes and listen. I've been told, especially after lunch, that uh, my voice uh, is a one way to, uh, to doze <laughs> off if you need a little nap after. Uh, oh, it's, it, it needs to be a little louder. Okay. Is there, where's the microphone? <laughs> uh, I will talk in the direction of the microphone. Um, so um, I came uh, to London uh, for the first time, came to England for the first time, and what is that it? Late October of 1981, with a newly minted PhD without an academic position. It really took me years to find uh, a regular academic position, probably decades of wandering from position to position. And uh, I came up with this idea, uh, which I pitched to the Canadian Broadcasting Company for one of their uh, regular series um, on sociology, philosophy, history. Uh, to do a series on classical Chinese philosophy and its relevance in the modern world. And so they paid me to come over and interview a number of really important uh, scholars uh, in the field at the time. And so uh, during that visit, I spent a wonderful uh, hour and a half talking to Joseph Needham, whom many of you will know as the the author and creator of this marvelous series, Science and Civilization in China. If you don't know it, please uh, uh, dive in. It's uh, it's wonderful. Uh, uh, there's also a, a biography of him that's come out in the past half decade called The Man Who Loved China. Anyway, it was a wonderful opportunity to talk to him. And I, I was struck by something he said, and it's really stayed with me to this day. Um, he said, uh, it's only because I've been a lifelong socialist that I was able to see the communitarian aspects of early Chinese societies. And, you know, that struck me as unusual because I, I've been trained as a scholar of classical Chinese religion and philosophy to never admit to any personal perspective from my own training or intellectual commitments. But it seemed to me somewhat paradoxical because, as, as Needham stated, wasn't it only because of these intellectual commitments that he was able to see certain aspects of what he was studying that he would not have been able to without these commitments. So um, I look back on the models that I had of scholarship to see and then to connect with uh, the, 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 uh, the relationship between uh, personal uh, experiences, the, the subjective and the objective when you're doing scholarship. And my early models have made a, a very strong uh, uh, line of separation between the work that they did and their, their personal commitments as far as I could see. So in fact, the first person I studied Buddhism with was Kenneth Chan. And he is still, uh, 50 years later, the only person to have had the, the courage to write a, a, a history of Chinese Buddhism. The entire field of Chinese but his uh, his personal commitments were were not at all related to Chinese Buddhism, as far as I can tell. And then there was Frederick Mose, who many of you may know as a Ming Dynasty historian of some note. But um, uh, Fritz, uh, as he was called, uh, wrote this wonderful little book called Intellectual Foundations of China, which is now out of print. But I used it for many years in teaching. Classical Chinese philosophy. As far as as far as those models were uh, representing themselves to me, I, I, it, there was no relationship to that. Um, but then, uh, Wei Ming uh, came to Princeton, and I had the great good fortune to be uh, studying with him and to study the problem of Du's uh, life uh, work is not called amazing. Uh, he was very influenced by neo neo Confucians in the in the 20th century, um, and uh, for Du, self cultivation was both an academic concern but also very much a personal. Concern. So that I really that I really related to that because discovering uh, <laughs> as much as I could learn about what 
what human nature is, what human potential is, and how to bridge this is really the, the heart of a lot of the work uh, that I did in my, in my academic. And then, of course, a decade later, I had the great good fortune uh, to encounter uh, one of the most brilliant and eccentric scholars of classical Chinese philosophy and religion and the grammar of classical Chinese, Angus Graham. A.C. Graham uh, was uh, uh, from 1952 until he retired in 1984, was uh, the uh, senior lecturer, lecture and senior lecturer in Chinese philosophy at the School of Oriental and African Studies. And he was an incredibly um, brilliant translator who had the gift of being able to take a seat, look at, look at a, a series of sentences or just a sentence in classical Chinese and, and brilliantly translated because he saw the context because so much of, of what you understand and translate classical Chinese based on and he could see that, and he could get that really quickly. Um, that's an, that's, I don't, does anybody recognize anybody? And not, uh, I don't, not me, because that person is. <laughs> do you recognize the person with the cigar? Sarah. Yes, it's Sarah <laughs> Allen. Yes, Sarah Allen was a professor at the, at SOAS, and then at Dartmouth, and uh, she's retired now, living in Berkeley. Uh, she sent me that picture. This was at the, we had a retirement party for Angus. Um, and uh, that's Angus's wife. And then uh, there's a very interesting figure uh, with the mustache and long sideways. His, his name is Alexander Kutagorsky. And uh, some of you um, may know him. He was a scholar of, um, of Madhyamaka Buddhism in India and wrote one of the most impenetrable books I've ever encountered on Madhyamaka. Uh, in which paragraphing seemed alien. So this made Madhyamaka even more difficult than it was. But uh, I had many interesting conversations with him as well. So the, the retirement party, uh, when Angus was forced to retire at the age of 65. Anyway, but um, so, and first, you know, the personal commitments and interests uh, uh, I, we're not apparent with Angus, but then as I came to know him, uh, I, uh, I got to know what they were. Uh, and I, really based on many, many nights we had of actually closing down the bar in the basement of SOAS, uh, which is a, was a wonderful institution. God, I hope it's still going. Um, so another very important influence on my life was uh, the Zen master, uh, Rinzai Zen master, Joshua Sasaki. I was introduced to uh, him by Di Weiming, who was introduced to him by the very famous Japanese Zen philosopher Nishitani Kiji. Uh, he was the, the, the leading philosopher in Japan in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and I was able, over a number of decades uh, of practice, to study Chan texts um, and Zen practice with this man. And I eventually became the academic advisor for most of the 35 annual summer seminars um, on Buddhism that we organized in conjunction with uh, uh, UCLA and Cornell and eventually University of New Mexico. And uh, I became in, in effect his literary executor after he passed away in uh, 2014. Yes, right. Yes, that's what I just said. Um, so, you know, part of my training as an academic, of course, was in analyzing classical Chinese texts uh, from the Taoist and Buddhist traditions and pushing the limits of textual criticism and historical and social contextualization. And in so doing, maintaining a strict commitment to the principle of scholarly objectivity. And I, I, I love the philological work that, that I was able to, to do in the textual history of the White on Side, as you Myron pointed out. And that uh, wonderful uh, opportunity we had. Uh, so Sarah organized a conference on the Guodian. Uh, this may be too much of the weeds of Chinese philosophy. The Guodian, there's a, yes, I'm not going to go there. Anyway, um, wonderful conference. Um, so, but I also realized at the same time that because I'd been pursuing training in a contemplative practice that fully engaged both mind and body, 
that I was able to see certain aspects of the contemplative tradition that I was studying that I would have missed without this training. The other really inspirational uh, uh, work that I found as I was pursuing my graduate studies, uh, and I came to focus increasingly on the comparative study of mystical experience, was this book by Fritz Stahl, otherwise known as the scholar of Vedic religion. A very interesting man. And he wrote this uh, rather controversial book at the time called Exploring Mysticism, in which he argued that if you want to really study mysticism, that it's essential that you practice in the tradition or a tradition, a mystical tradition with similar types of discipline. A very radical position at the time in, in the academic. Um, so, uh, and not a very popular one. Also, not a very popular one for graduate students or spouse. You have to be very careful with graduate students. Um, uh, so, of course, I'm totally committed to the fact that distance analytical perspectives are essential to rational scholarship in the sciences and humanities, but they cannot be relied upon exclusively to render the best possible research out this is because these perspectives often labor under the pretense that they are purely objective, unbiased, and rational. Yet they are, in essence, created by the subjective minds of scholars who often are pretending to a totally objective, a God's eye view, a view from nowhere that Alan Wallace contends is actually taken from Abrahamic a religious ontology of a creator God who stands apart from creation. And that's in Wallace's wonderful book, The Taboo of Subjectivity, which in many ways is a foundational work for the field of contemporary studies, published in 2001. And Wallace has written more books but the, 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 on similar topics and updated it a little bit, but the basic arguments are there. Um, so despite the desirability of this goal of scholarly objectivity, it's kind of a slippery phantom, often falling victim to precisely the kind of subjective bias of the work. The humanities, this can lead to passing off hidden subjective agendas as scholarly truths. And having spent most of my academic career in departments of religious studies, I could quote you chapter and verse there, but I think probably uh, it's best that I don't go down that road. Um, and, and probably most of you can come up with more than a few examples of well known academics in Buddhist studies or Chinese studies who pretend to objectivity without the slightest recognition that their work has been influenced by their own life experiences and intellectual dependence. I wrote, I published an article about a decade and a half ago called Against Cognitive Imperialism, in which I argued that, uh, that we should put our cards on the table as scholars. We should talk about who the main intellectual influences are and what has brought us to the study uh, and ask the kinds of questions and look at the kinds of materials that we have in our academic careers. Um, and in the sciences, of course, researcher bias is a huge problem. It, it can skew the design and the results of major and well-funded research projects. And the United States government has an office of research integrity uh, in health and human services. And I checked on their website and they have over 75 documented cases in the last 10 years of what they call misconduct in government funded projects. Uh, and their consequences for the researchers have been accused and uh, I guess convicted, I don't know what that process is like, of, uh, of misconduct. And it, it's it's bias in the way that they've set up the research. They may or may not be aware of it. And, and of course, there's always a problem with scientific research that if it's funded by a private organization, such as a drug company, um, that it, uh, it tends to be, um, the, the results tend to be closer to what uh, is, uh, is desirable for the market. So that's always a real issue that you have to be very careful. Um, so Wallace, you know, how do we how do we bring kind of honest representation of our, our personal commitments and our, our, our subjective experiences? How can we bring this um, into our into our scholarship? Uh, but yet avoid biased research with hidden agendas. Wallace suggests that we develop a critical subjective. Um, and he, 
he advocates that it's possible to use systematically trained human subjectivity to clearly and impartially examine it. But it is imperative, he says, in cognitive science and psychology fields, and I think it's crucial in the humanity. Um, so when this is done, we not only develop a critical self-awareness of the bias that we're bringing to the table, we develop the ability to use rationality for its own sake and not in the service of an unexamined subjective bias. We also, I would argue, develop the ability to become more aware of the intuitive and creative processes that underlie many great scientific and humanistic discoveries. So how can we responsibly bring our subjective windows on the world? Each one of us has this unique window on the world and graduate students and students don't uh, don't underestimate the uh, the uniqueness and the contribution and the, uh, of each of you. Each of you has a unique window on the world, and you bring that into whatever work that you do. And don't underestimate the importance of that. Um, so, how do we bring this uh, into our research and teaching, but without you know creating a whole bunch of narcissistic? Uh, 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 egotistical self-based biases. So it's through what I would like to deem a kind of critical subjectivity informed by our new field of studies. Um, and I want to talk to you about what we've done, uh, pedagogy we've used in the epistemology that underlies that pedagogy and its foundations in uh, Chan and Zen uh, Buddhism uh, as the uh, as I present not only the pedagogy, but the underlying epistemology. So, Contemplative Studies uh, Initiative, uh, we founded probably uh, 10, 16 years ago. Um, and it was just a group of, of uh, uh, like minded uh, thinkers who were teaching and thought that it would be important to our students to in some fashion find a way to bring the contemplative practices that we knew it had very positive impacts on our lives to bring it into uh, formally bring it into academic studies in the university. Um, and normally that's of course kept personal, it's kept aside and it's, it hasn't been a way to integrate it in, into the actual course curriculum, but that's what we were working to do. And of course our founding principles were uh, uh, I, the idea from uh, Wang Yang Ming, the great uh, 15th and 16th century neo Confucian thinker, that if you want to know the taste of the bitterness of the bitter melon, you got to take a bite. So, experience is important. And of course, John Dewey, who, uh, as it turns out, did not invent the Dewey Decimal System, but for many. He was an empirical philosopher. He says, education, in order to accomplish its ends, must be based upon experience. There is no discipline in the world so severe as the discipline of experience subjected to the test of intelligent development and design. And then, of course, William James, the great thinker, who was at least a century ahead of his time, if not more. Uh, wrote the principles of psychology and the varieties of principal experience to absolutely foundational works, which I recommend to you all if you have the interest that brought you here. They're, they're absolutely uh, uh, the important sources for psychology and for the, the study of mysticism and religious experience. Anyway, he says, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. An education which should improve this faculty should be the, ex, uh, the education par excellence. He expresses the, the you know, basically, he, he wrote this in about 19. Uh, pessimism that, uh, that that could be done within the academic context. But in fact, uh, that's what really we've attempted to do in setting up our program in contemplative studies. Ah. <laughs> I learned this one trick when I was 
Jesus, or what I have forgotten how I did for many years. Ago. So, contemplative studies as an emerging field uh, <laughs> studies the underlying philosophy, psychology, and phenomenology of contemplation focuses on the many ways to concentrate, and broaden, and deepen conscious awareness of the gateway to leading more ethically responsible and fulfilling lives. Identifies the varieties of contemplative experiences, engages scientific and philosophical discussions, of them, and cultivates first person knowledge of them and assesses their meaning and significance. <clears throat> but if you uh, are talking about contemplative studies, you have to have a working definition. And so this is this is the, our working definition. It is the focusing of the attention in a sustained fashion, leading to deepened states of concentration, tranquility, and insight, a broadening of the awareness, to self-contextualizing experiences that are the basis for other regarding virtues such as empathy, passion, and love, and which provide a crucial foundation for social engagement. <clears throat> Contemplation occurs on a spectrum from the rather common spontaneous experiences of absorption and activity to the most profound experiences deliberately cultivated in the religious tradition. This is an important continuum. Um, and so, what we include are intentional practices such as uh, what Hado calls spiritual exercises, which are also, were also done in Greek, classic and Greek law. Um, intentional practices are ones that deliberately focus containing contemplative states of focused attention. Uh, we see this most commonly in Buddhism tradition, religious traditions. And we also have these non intentional states, these flow experiences, practices that lead to deeply focused attention that are done for your own sake. So the goal isn't to get into a contemplative state, but you can get into a contemplative state by. Just becoming deeply absorbed in proper planning, but sort of absorbed in cricket, but no cricket. Baseball. Mm -hmm. Baseball. There are baseball players who, who will tell you that they are so focused <laughs> and in the zone, and they don't meditate, although some of them in Japan uh, they're organized by the team to do same meditation. They'll tell you that they can tell what the pitch coming is, because as it comes out of the hand of the, of the pitcher, they can tell by the spin of the ball what the pitch is going to be, what it's going to, what movement it's going to have. That locked in. They don't move. That's a contemplative state. That's a flow experience. And it's on a continuum uh, with the deliberately cultivated uh, contemplative states of meditative tradition. There, this is an important subset of, of, of human experience because of the potential they have. Transforming, impacting, and transforming uh, human beings' lives in a very positive direction. And they deserve to be studied on their own. I mean, of course, we always contextualize it, but they're an important subset of human experience. They really uh, deserve their own uh, study. And that's what we're doing. So we, we approach uh, contemplative experiences from the sciences. All the, particularly the brain sciences, and also clinical applications. So, so many of you may know that mindfulness has become a very important clinical method for used for for treating many different illnesses, and in its in its I would call it a deracinated. It's been taken out of its cultural. Um, and brought into a kind of modern scientific practice, which has the benefit of making it acceptable to many, many more people, but has the drawback of not being fully contextualized and able to take people uh, into to deeper levels of human experience uh, that they have the potential to experience because that fits into the realm of religion. And John Kavanson and, and, and others who followed him have drawn for a Anyway, in the science, it's a lot of work also in neuroscience, studying brain states and brain waves using EEG and uh, functional uh, MRIs. 
Um, of course, in the humanities, uh, there's a kind of rich contemplative tradition to be studied from many parts of the world and in the creative arts. So we, we try to embrace all of these in our field. Um, so we've graduated 60 students uh, uh, so far, and our, our, our students have gone into many different walks of life uh, with the, the tools of, of understanding of what, what we hope to call contemplative intelligence. Uh, understanding the nature of contemplative practice, understanding context in which those practices have emerged, understanding some of the scientific research, knowing how to read scientific articles um, on the contemplative uh, practice. Uh, anyway, I was going to tell you what each of these students is doing, but it's going too far afield. Um, we keep in touch with our alums, with their grads. We're very proud. So, what's unique to the, what, the way we teach? How do we in, how we bring contemplative practices into the classroom? They're in uh, these courses we call meditation lab or med lab. You have to say that very carefully because sometimes people think we're saying meth lab. So we, we do not have meth lab courses. Or med lab. Um, and we, we we have set up courses to have these additional laboratory sections in which the laboratory is your body and mind. And in those, uh, in those laboratory sections, these meditation rooms, we try out different contemplative practices that are coordinated with the text we are reading uh, in, in, in a given week um, and discussing in, in uh, other contexts and lectures and a classroom interaction. And so, we therefore combine, I'm going to uh, break this down a little bit more for you, traditional third person study of contemplative practices in their philosophical and historical context with um, innovative critical first person methods in which students empirically experience and critically examine contemplative techniques without prior commitment to their efficacy. They're investigating them. It's an empirical uh, testing study. And uh, for many, many years, we had this wonderful space. It was a dance. And as long as we got there, uh, either there eight or nine, not great for students, but the, the uh, reason we, we had access to this, uh, uh, this dance studio was the dancers like to stay up late, but they don't like to get up early. So we were able to get in there and have our meditation class. This probably goes back to 2009 or 2010. This photo I uh, created and put together by one of our So, just to give an example of what I'm talking about in one of our courses. So, I teach an introduction to contemplative studies course. And so, in the course, we read primary text and translation. Um, and we read secondary works, either on the historical or philosophical context of those primary texts, or on um, uh, the underlying uh, intellectual rationales and foundations for the field of contemplative studies. So here it's Wallace's taboo, and uh, later we read Csikszentmihalyi's flow. And um, what we also do is that we coordinate the meditation labs with the text that we're reading. So uh, when we when we when we don't these are I would call uh, constructive representations of possible contemplative techniques that are actually uh, uh, that underlie the the early texts of the Taoist tradition. Uh, so coiling and uncoiling is a passage from verse seventeen of the Inward Chain text that uh, that. Published a book on called Original Dao. And uh, uh, <clears throat> it's just a basic kind of expanding and contracting of your reading space. So we try that out in the class when we look at what the text says about that. So there's this interaction between uh, third person approaches, which is traditionally done in the classroom, and this kind of innovative let's try out, let's kind of test out with our body and minds together. Um, Let's try out contemplative practices that could possibly underlie those texts. Uh, Bella's breathing. Uh, 
the space between heaven and earth isn't it like a bellow in the data zone? Data zone five. For a centered observation, data zone 16. And then with John said, we do this free and easy wandering uh, meditation, which students love because it's, it's kind of non intentional meditation practice. It's allowing, instead of doing this focused attention, Scientists now call focused attention. It's top down, focusing on some aspect of, of your, your body or your breathing or the tip of the nose or happens. Instead of doing that, you let the mind wander and then come back, wander and then come back. It's non intentional meditation that actually is practiced um, a little bit differently, but in the transcendental meditation, which some of you may know about. Um, so that's the basic idea behind our. Courses in which we have meditation. This is uh, an individual session that's broken down into these parts. I, I, I try to give students uh, some uh, some basic uh, stretching, yoga, yoga stretching exercises, just so. Uh, it's wonderful if you can sit on the floor cross legged. I mean, if you can meditate in the chair, of course, but to just jump into that without warming up. It's uh, not a great habit. We do that and then we work with a contemplative technique. And then students uh, write their brief comments or questions, and then we discuss what, what happened, and then the journaling that students do. Um, and they do that online now. So we have different courses. So uh, that's the pedagogy of the study in a nutshell. But it's based on an epistemology that's related to the critical subjectivity question. Um, and uh, it's very uh, important. So I don't know if, if any of you know, uh, know the name Francisco Varela. He was a Chilean uh, philosopher and cognitive neuroscientist who was very uh, important in establishing the field of contemplative studies. And, um, he and uh, uh, two other people, uh, Evan Thompson and Eleanor Rush, wrote uh, a book called The Embodied Mind. Um, and <clears throat> there's a, a group of scientists, of course, who's still um, working in that circle. And they approached the study of these, I just Listed their names. Uh, Eleanor Rush worked, uh, worked with them uh, closely. Claire Petrimogin, anyway, Richard Davidson, are all part of this group that really founds contemplative science, but is also foundational to the field of contemplative studies. And, and so these really, they talk about three interactive epistemological perspectives. Third person. And this is the, uh, the kind of at a distance. Uh, objective type of scholarship and academics that we do throughout the years. Second person is, is very much engaged in intersubjective one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, dyadic communication. Uh, first person is really a subjective experience. Uh, but I would like to add uh, to these uh, one uh, a fourth dimension, fourth aspect. And that is what I call no person experience. It's immediate, it's non intentional, not processed through self identity, but it's non self referential. And uh, I derive these ideas from classical Chinese uh, philosophical texts like the Zhuangzi, but also uh, Chan and Zen texts like Ethan Linji. Found is that one of the uh, persisting traditions is that uh, Rinzai is a, a Japanese pronunciation, and that's the tradition of uh, Sabaki Roshi that I, that I practiced. Um, <clears throat> so, no person experience. So, I'm, I'm going to move through this quickly. Third person is, is I think, everybody's familiar with. Second person is really deep listening. It's really paying attention. It's often one-on-one, -on -one, it's often dyadic. It's communicating as fully as you can, uh, uh, but also listening. So for example, in our classroom, I don't want, I, I, I tell students, unless they have a, a health reason that they need to have screens, 
that I don't uh, I don't let them use screens. Like if they want to take notes, they can take notes on it. You won't pass it. I don't know. This is a uh, everything's changing so quickly, but uh, there's even some of the students uh, using artificial intelligence to write your papers. But anyway, it's really important uh, to go back and uh, just pay attention and listen carefully uh, and to train actually. Really helped. I mean, it's really helped me in my life. When I was when I was at the age of many of my students, I was very good at asking questions, but not very good at paying attention. So this is a problem in relationships, which you know, you ask your partner, uh, your partner says something to you, or you ask a question to your partner, and and then they they answer your question, but then you go you space out and you're thinking about what to make for dinner. Uh, what uh, when you take the dog for a walk, and, and then you know after a couple of minutes, your partner goes, "Isn't that right?" Uh, uh, is that right? It's, uh, yes. Okay, I'm going to guess. Yes. What do you mean? Yes. <laughs> Whoops. So it's really important to learn how to really pay attention. So that's part of second person uh, perspective. It's also used in, uh, as an interview technique in interviewing. Uh, uh, Subjects in, in experiments that are being done uh, in, in Paris by Claire Pitt-Lagin and Michelle Goodwell. I'm really interested. They call it microphenomenology, in which they elicit answers. Uh, anyway, it's, it's beyond what I can say. But that's second person. So, first person. More strongly, people are not finding it. They can't. So, am I, is it too fast or? Soft. Too soft. <laughs> more, more, um, yeah. Where's the microphone? <laughs> Get closer to the microphone. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Um, so, first person, uh, the, yeah. <laughs> first person epistemology is grounded in the experiencing subject. It's direct, immediate, and empirical. It's the field in which critical subjectivity is developed. It is the constant flow of subjective experience. But taking a closer look at first-person epistemology, we can actually see that it reveals something a little deeper, that subjectivity is a process in which there's a constant flow of experience in which the subject experiences some aspect of its world in one moment, completely independent of self-identity, and then in subsequent moments, objectifies this prior moment of experience and relates it into the vast web of perceptual and conceptual categories out of which the self constitutes its world and interacts with it. This means that for an instant, conscious experience has no object. So hence, we propose a fourth epistemology, an epistemology of no person. This constitutes an important challenge to the Descartian view that consciousness is always consciousness of something, be that an object in the external world or an idea or a perception. It is an idea derived from Chan and Zen epistemology that rejects the primacy of a fixed sense of self-identity as foundational to the construction of subjective experience. This is exquisitely epitomized by the famed Kyoto School founder, uh, the philosopher Nishida Kitaro. This means. And what he says is, it is not that experience exists because there is an individual as we normally but that an individual exists because there is experience. Let me say that again. It's a very important, uh, very insightful phrase that challenges the Descartian view about consciousness. It is not that experience exists because there is an individual, that an individual exists because there is experience. So for Nishida, Individuality emerges from a continuum 
of non-self-referential experience. It's pure experience, what he calls pure experience, is both pre-reflective and immediate, transcends both self and other in such a way that it does not contain any specific individual or personal content. It's immediate experience in the present moment. It is non-objectified by the first person experiencing subject. It is cognizant without judging. It can involve implicit subject-object distinctions, but not self-other distinctions. It is first and foremost embodied, that is experienced as a momentary integrated wholeness of body and mind from which the sense of self-identity and individuality arises in subsequent moments. In the classroom, in our med labs, it is the momentary experience of breathing in and breathing out, the sensation of sound, the feeling of the body as a whole without objectification, whatever stimuli are present without the interference of processing it through one's self-identity. <clears throat> and so, um, I've developed a, a technique that we use in the med labs that, uh, for investigating different contemplative practices. Uh, and it's a consistent way that we approach uh, looking at a different, all the different types of contemplative practices we study. I call it mindful and body embodiment training. Um, and it's interoceptive, intuitive, and an active focuses on the body, mind, and space and time. And it's a, this consistent method, and it really comes out of, it's derived from a Chan and Zen practice. And so, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to uh, just introduce this to you. Uh, for just a couple of moments, just to show you what, what we do. So, it's completely up to you whether you want to do this or not. We're sitting in chairs. So I always tell people if you're sitting in chairs, you need to have both feet on the left. If you're kind of in a, a stable of position as you can be in the chair. And find a good place for your hands, either on your on your knees or um, I'm partial because of uh, Zen practice to putting right hand down, left hand on top, and making a circle and then putting that in my lap. Helps remind me to pull my breathing down into my uh, lower abdomen. Into the um, so, uh, eyes uh, closed, you cracked open just a little bit to let in some lighting. Begin by taking three deep and relaxing breaths into your body, mind, and space and time. Turning your attention. To your sphere of experience in all four dimensions. What do I mean by this? So, first dimension is height. So, from the from the feeling of your feet on the floor, your body in the chair, bring your attention up to the to your forehead, to the top of your head. Feel the vertical space that each one of us occupies. Stretch that space from foot to foot, from knee to knee, elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder, ear to ear, the horizontal space, horizontal plane that each one of us occupies. And then with that, those two dimensions of height, width, Bring that rectangle or square down to your feet and then tilt it to the back of your neck. Swing it around to your tailbone, move it to your forehead. Get a sense of depth. And then the fourth dimension is time. So you breathe in and breathe out. Time. Through us and around us. So, just to do a short exercise of 
expanding your sphere of experience as you breathe in and contracting your sphere of experience as you breathe out. Right. Signal the beginning of the sit with three bells and the end. This basic empirical method of investigation, we can approach different types of sitting meditation and try out techniques of training the attention that relate to specific texts we're studying. Slowly open your eyes. So, this particular method is drawn from Chan and Zen ideas and practices. I'd like to discuss those briefly uh, before then coming back to the topic of critical subjectivity where I will close. So there's a very important uh, text, foundational text to the Rinzai Zen tradition, the tradition in the China, Chan. And there's this idea of the true person of no fixed position, usually translated as true man of no rank, but I don't think that's the right way to translate it. Uh, not anyway. It is this very you, the formless one, standing distinctly before me, shining alone. This can expand the Dharma and listen to it. So within your body field of the five skandhas, that's an alternative reading that, that faded in the tradition in favor of the lump of red flesh, which some of you may, but I think the skandhas makes, much, makes clearer what the text is. Within your body field of the five standards, there is a true person of no fixed position, splendidly manifesting itself without being separated from you by even the width of a fine hair. So Lindy is here emphasizing the immediacy of selfless, non-dual, present moment experience. And this is the foundation for mindful embodiment training. Selfless, non-dual, present moment experience. Uh, Sasaki Roshi talks about it like this. All of you are doing practice here. However, it seems that a lot of you have forgotten. You do not know your dwelling place. For the dwelling 
place of the self he calls it uh, uh, in japanese jiban no sumibasa the dwelling place of the self fundamentally there is no practice divorced from the dwelling place there is no zen practice in which one practices apart from or separate from this dwelling place when you appear space appears with you when you disappear space disappears with you your dwelling place goes away and as i always teach you though you mustn't look at this from the standpoint of two dimensions. That is, this is the, what I call a third person standpoint. You must realize that when you sit there in the diamond posture or full lotus, you're acting three dimensionally. He adds time to that too. So don't get stuck in the two dimensional standpoint. And then he talks about this true person of no fixed position that Rinzai talks about. It's someone who dwells in this no position place. Each and every one of you has this has a place of dwelling and this exists in opposition to that of other people and the dwelling place that is the place of no fixed position need not stand in opposition to other dwelling places no position no opposition this place of no position and this person of no position need not stand in opposition to anything this is the one true person of no fixed position this one true person provides the world regardless of nationality details. So this is the mode of cognition that it's talking about that takes into account um, this insight uh, uh, from the Zen tradition as it developed in Japan in the 20th century through people like Nishida and Nishitani and, and Sasaki and many others. Conscious experience is a constantly flowing continuum. This continuum alternates between a fully embodied, three-dimensional, non-self-attached, non-dual experience. And the immediately following objectification and further objectification of that during subsequent seconds of time, so constantly. In these subsequent seconds, further categorization of, of experience occurs and helps to provide the rich context of each of our experiential worlds. In the Descartian universe, such a vision of consciousness doesn't make sense. But it's time to see this as one epistemology, not the only one. This systematic way to examine many, if not all, forms of contemplative practice is not just Zen rhetoric. It has a firm grounding in recent scientific research. Um, and I'm going to just uh, touch base with a few of these uh, the scientific research ideas. Some of you may know uh, the work of uh, James Austin, who's a uh, neurologist who synthesizes a lot of the work uh, on uh, neuroscience, the neuroscientific study of Zen experience. And he theorizes that Zen meditation represents a shift from egocentric perspectives that are linked to a particular neural pathway in the brain to allocentric perspectives linked to a different one. And I see this as an increase in the awareness of the presence of non-self-referential, no-person perspectives in our moment-to-moment -moment experience. And he contrasts egocentric and allocentric. Again, where is this in relation to me? Where is it? He use, utilizes touch and perception, utilizes vision. And there's these certain parts of the brain uh, certain pathways, and it's not just Austin, it, it, it's a kind of recognized uh, and accepted idea within neuroscience. One is the dorsal attention network, and one is the ventral. Um, uh, another really wonderful article by Adal Lutz and Davidson really tries to come up with a, with a, a full blown theory about all different contemplative uh, meditative practices. Um, and the one I want to focus on is the third one. So we talk about object-oriented insight practice, subject-oriented, and then this non-dual-oriented practices are designed to elicit a shift into a mode of experiencing in which the cognitive structures of self and other and subject-object are no longer the dominant mode of experience. Non-dual-oriented practices often emphasize the importance of releasing attempts to control direct or alter the mind in any way, and also serve to undo the reification of a witnessing observer that is separate from the objects of awareness. So it's the, 
It's the idea of a fixed self that stands apart from its own experience and analyzes it. That's what uh, Sasaki Roshi called uh, uh, two dimensional as opposed to three dimensions. You're fully embodied in the moment um, and not standing apart and analyzing separately experience. So the goal of these de deconstructive, deconstructive practices is not simply to maintain awareness of different aspects of experience, but rather to gain direct experiential insight into the nature and dynamics of experience. And uh, another group of scientists at University of Utah uh, have developed uh, techniques for teaching what they call non-dual awareness and for studying uh, the, the kind of everyday non-dual awareness that people have in their lives. And they report a greater capacity to decenter from the experience. Decentering may loosen the boundaries of self by encouraging what they call a metacognitive perspective in which one disidentifies from self-referential cognition and thereby de-reifies the self as the subject of experience. So it's possible through mindful embodiment training to develop a consistent method to investigate contemplative practices that can serve as the foundation for a truly critical subjectivity. Through mindful embodiment training, we can add a fourth epistemic aspect to the study of conscious experience, as is no person experience. Through mindful embodiment training, we gain insight into important aspects of the moment to moment flow of experience that is non-self-referential and immediate. This non-self-referential -self and immediate experience is the empirical foundation of the Chan and Zen idea of the true person of no fixed position. It's an unbiased flowing cognition, constantly aware of what Davidson calls the dynamics of experience. Yet this experience by its very nature as non-dual and not objectified does not depend on the idea of the true person. That is, one can have this experience without any knowledge of Chan and Zen, yet it is the quintessential Chan and Zen experience. This true person can be systematically developed through deconstructive allocentric contemplative practices that enable the development of a no-person epistemology. And this no-person epistemology can then be the basis for a complete first-person integration of all four epistemological aspects of human conscious experience to form a critical subjectivity that enables consciousness to study itself through direct experience in the present moment and through analytical objectification that follow. This most importantly includes the historical and philosophical contextualization of contemplative experiences within their cultures of origin. This is absolutely essential. Um, this is important to complement scientific research that has taken them out. Um, and uh, deconstructed, decentering, allocentric practices are helpful to us as scholars, but also to our students. And this is a, just a touching base with this uh, article, which uh, studied uh, how many, 36 uh, women and uh, 77 students. Um, from the, uh, our med meditation and courses and came up with these really interesting results, which uh, you can see on, on these different scales, the mindfulness scales and self-compassion scales. It really significant uh, uh, changes. I mean, more for women than for men, but definitely for both. Um, and um, things like being able to observe oneself and, and not being more non-judgmental, uh, there's a increases in significant increases in self-compassion uh, as a result of, of the course. And these are students who, who did a 12-week course uh, with contemplative med lab integrating. Um, and so finally, the critical subjectivity that we have developed through this distinctive pedagogy and epistemology of contemplative studies is based on what might be called a constructive retrieval of Chan ideas grounded in a traditional Zen practice that emphasizes a non-dual embodied. This allocentric practice is empirically grounded in deconstructing the idea of a fixed sense of self-identity and in recognizing consciousness as a constant ebb and flow, flow of non-dual and dualistic cognition. 
Students in our courses are able to develop an increasing ability to decenter their experiences and hence able to rebound more quickly from the challenges of daily life. This produces a resilience that has been demonstrated repeatedly through scientific studies with our students and others. As scholars, this also promotes the ability to better understand how our intellectual commitments influence the work we do so we can remove the taboo of subjectivity without completely tumbling into academic narcissism and the false pretense of scholarly objectivity. As Sartre once said, mauvaise foi isn't just bad living. Thank you so much, Al, for um, that very interesting um, exploration of Chan and his points in the development of convention studies. And now to give a response, um, person who's probably going most to change the field of Theravada cognitive studies uh, through her many publications are uh, own solution or to give a response to Thank you, Helen. On behalf of the Zool, I would like to thank you uh, for your wonderful summary of perspectives from them that relate to us and are shared with us. Uh, it has been a, a very fresh, learned, and a time. The ways of the critical first person. And indeed, many persons can be introduced into academic discourse on the sub subject of contemplative experience. Having worked in the field of the study of Buddhist texts for some decades now, I feel as if unspoken puzzles at the back of my mind have finally been voiced. Your comments on the hidden subjective agendas so often operating in the field of Buddhist studies will resonate deeply with those working in any form of scholarship in contemplation or retreat. We recognize the symptoms of veiled prejudice in what he termed the slippery phantom of scientific objectivity. For instance, I work on narrative chant, female rituals, uh, popular bhavana, devotion and lay meditative practice. For years, such activities have been plagued with words like just and mere in what purport to be objective and so-called non-confessional products of academic discourse. Statements such as these need not concern us as they are just rituals by the uneducated, or such popular Buddhist narratives are merely folk narratives and do not reflect pure Buddhist principle, and even these are merely lay practices and not real meditation. These statements have passed unchallenged for years and still surface constantly. A so-called scientific objectivity has led to the neglect of highly sophisticated and nuanced chant systems, canonical Buddhist narratives, carefully undertaken devotions, and numerous lay meditative practices. Biased positions implicit in such othering of agency and the people involved have for decades hampered, hampered any serious study of the principal activities which have formed the lifeblood of Southeast Asian Buddhism and its meditative practices. And I'm sure the same applies to many other practices in Asia. Those working in all arts disciplines are familiar with the diminishment of qualitative first-person experience in the service of what you have termed the God's eye of you. In a stance that espouses what you term also the, the myth of scientific objectivity. Accurate, qualitative, well-observed first-person comment is the hallmark of all the best kinds of philosophical, theological, anthropological, 
historical, literary, and artistic analysis. Without it, the subjects become dead and lacking in human truthfulness. Assessment of the performative aspects of a Shakespearean tragedy, the effect of standing in front of a Rembrandt, or the particular weight of a, the repetition of a musical motif in a symphony cannot be undertaken without considering first-person perspective of those for whom the work is intended. The audience, the viewers, the listeners. Me, you, them, us, and whatever else is experiencing anything to particular point. It is in the consciousness of recipient beings that art, philosophy, and music can act as a catalog, a catalyst for personal transformation the arousing of new understanding or an often precisely pitched emotional effect. How much more is this the case of studying meditative systems? If you want to know the bitterness of the, the bitter melon, you have to eat a bit bitter melon yourself. One young man mentioned, and you also cited William James, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment of character and work. This is the investigation at the heart of contemplative study. Fortunately, the scientific and medical worlds have recently stressed, has recently stressed, the importance of consciousness itself as the object of scrutiny and critical first-person analysis. Uh, medical and cl clinical programs um, Harry Cavell, SK Toombs, research bias you describe, and are now emphasizing study of one key in some overlooked participant in medical events, the patient. Mindfulness training insists on first-person examination of the therapist's response to the exercises undertaken over a period of time as a key element in absorbing both the background and applicability of the programs discussed. Scholars such as Paul Dennison and Alan Wallace have, for instance, subjected meditators to EEG and find results that belie conventional thinking. What is occurring in the body and mind when uh, meditation and other associated activities take place? So, exploring the first person, the second person, the third person. And as you argue with no person, we can understand a full range and depth of meditative practice and indeed most disciplines. It seems to me that contemplative studies is an important route for the future. It suggests workable means of allowing the perspectives, perspectives of science, the humanities, and the creative arts to work with one another and learn from each other's. The epistemologies you suggest are challenging and grounds and ground studies thoroughly within a framework that balances, as you, see, as you say, subjective experience with the non subjective methods of contextual location. When you quote Nishida, it is not that experience exists because there is an individual, it's an individual exists because there is experience. We are looking in the direction that much. Contemporary discourse of the nature of mind is going. Recommendations to explore this look to me as a non expert, like the kinds of directions science, medical studies, and arts are taking in examination of the possibilities of the mind. Is consciousness simply an epiphenomenon of material elements, a byproduct of verifiable events? Is it subject to scientifically observed raw data and not worthy in itself of serious attention? The human species is starting to reflect on this very question with some urgency. We are indeed looking for the dwelling place that Roshi Sasaki describes. We need ways of investigating how consciousness works, 
how it reacts, interacts with others, and develops from multiple perspectives. I am grateful to this very timely tool for providing such a systematic, entertaining, and in the end, practical means of scrutinizing agency, consciousness, flow, and personal participation within an academic context. I very much hope that it will um, encourage those to explore the nature of the third person, first person, and many other ways, so that we can investigate more thoroughly the great meditative systems that have marked the history of philosophical and religious inquiry. So thank you very much. And I would also like to suggest that all lectures from now on have a breathing space. Thank you very much for that response, Sarah. And we are running a bit over time, but we've got uh, time for a few questions, if that's okay. Um, so I'll start with um, uh, a question from Kathy Tantrum. Um, she says, it is surely useful for scholarly endeavor for some experiential aspect to be there. But there may be some limitations to a university training in seeking to incorporate them into the curriculum. It seems to imply an assumption that everything is about technique, whereas many of the religious traditions concerned insist on other aspects. For example, suggesting that one gains experience through the quality of one's faith, or the chitta, etc., or the transmission from a master, etc. And it would have limitations for accessing esoteric traditions unless one is prepared to dismiss the traditional injunctions against open teaching. In which case, is one really connecting with a religious discipline, or in fact rather distorting it from an outside perspective? Let's start with a challenge. Very perceptive question, uh, raising a lot of interesting issues about the decontextualization of contemporary practice putting it in an academic curriculum. And yes, it tends to be, especially if you're using that mindful embodiment training. So it's a it's a, it's a technique that's that's sufficiently abstracted from, from any particular tradition that it could be used to explore the contemplative methods and practices in, in many different traditions. There are limits how far you can go. But this, you know we're not we're not able to bring the monastery into the classroom. There's just it's so much of the atmosphere, this is space and, and, and the sacred space, say nothing of the, the esoteric method that, that can't be carried over into the classroom. But they can be studied as from a third person perspective. Uh, at the same time, you are exploring the practices from this critical first person. So there's kind of a dual way. So that there are limits to what you can do in the class. But if you don't do the, the, the first person investigation, um, if you don't uh, do the mindful embodiment training, then, then the entire study of these esoteric traditions um, uh, remains from a third person perspective. So it, it, it's not a perfect representation and recreation of what happens in. in the, 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 committed, the committed detail of a, of, a, of a monastic tradition. But it gets us closer to what that experience is like. And, and therefore, it, it's, just, it's another tool by which we can approach the study of these. And I think it, it does get us closer than if we just did a complete person at a distance. Thank you. Um... We have time for a few more questions. Um, if you're online and listening, would like to put your questions in, please put them in the chat. Um, maybe I could just ask a, another question, um, uh, follow on from that. So uh, in most degrees, we have a kind of progression. And I'd like to hear a little bit about um, how, what the progression of those um, self-reflective um, sessions looks like. And how those aspects of your course are assessed. Yes, assessing. 
you know, how do you assess uh, in terms of his practice? I, mean, I suppose in an ideal world, or maybe it's not an ideal world, from a scientific perspective, we could hook people up to uh, uh, EEGs and be readings at the beginning of the course. And in kind of that's in the, the studies, the one study I showed you, that, that students, students at the beginning of the course did were hooked up to EEGs, there were EEG measurements. Uh, and they and they also did battery tests, and then at the end of the course, and that's where they get the, the the results of what happens during the course. So in terms of progression, you know, it's because the particular this particular course is a uh, is a kind of broad introduction to the field of contemplative study. Now we explore what the methods are, what the rationale, are, and and we investigate different contemplative traditions. So. Um, uh, with the with because you're doing different contemplative traditions a month to weeks to weeks a month, um, we the, the progression within those traditions is is small, but over the course of the semester, there there are significant changes uh, from doing practices in different traditions. So and those changes have been. Have been measured, for example, within a study of women benefiting more than men. So uh, there is progression. Students do get that they get more self aware. Uh, they, they are able to observe around uh, in difficult situations more quickly. So there is that kind of uh, uh, progression over the course of the semester. And I, I you know, I've, I've, done, I've done courses like this, taught courses like this. Since the spring of 2000, I, at one point I sat down and, and tried to figure out how many students have I taught in this course. It was probably 1,400 or 1,500. And I've been able to see them you know, in this very qualitative, I see the changes in, 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 in not everybody, in some people, but many of the students. It gives them some basic. Tools and methods. Uh, they're introduced to their practices from different traditions and they can see what works for them. So, does it work more to do a moving meditation or a sitting meditation? Work better? Uh, is the technique, it, 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 does it work better to focus on the tip of your nose when you're meditating on your breathing or an upper abdomen or lower abdomen or, or move your attention up and down the body, the body, etc., etc.? Et so, students. Will be introduced in this particular course to maybe 15 different contemplative methods that they explore to this consistent mindful embodiment training. Uh, and then they see this, this one oh, uh, uh, noting and labeling practice. Which one works best for me? And then they can go and they can pursue that on their own. We also uh, give grants to students for more intensive contemplative practices. Uh, in in, uh, in uh, meditation settings. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Bosley, so much for the lecture. Um, really inspiring to me as someone with like both a, a scholarly and a practical interest in um, meditation, but more in sort of Sanskrit philosophical traditions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm inclined to kind of ask you perhaps some, like maybe, maybe what is a hard philosophical question about the sort of no person experience perspective. I'm just interested in how you think it relates to language and whether there are sort of universal descriptions of this experience or um, you know, the, the Joshu Sazaki point about how um, that it provides um, um, it, it, it provides perspective regardless of nationality. Um, it sort of has this sense of objectivity. And I, I wonder how we would differentiate it then from the scholar side maybe this is in a big feature of like Western intellectual history. So, so, so the, the God's eye view is really is, is, a, is a third person that's you're separating from your continuum of experience and you're looking at it from the standpoint of supposedly a totally neutral uh, observer. But what you're doing is you're you actually you 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 never that. So you you have a kind of a bias in the way that you look at that experience. Um, this uh, no person perspective 
is it's different. It's it's being fully exploring through your body and mind together in the moment. Um, and so you can move back and forth between no in fact, that's the kind of natural flow. You move back and forth between no person and a first person or second person or third person, depending on the context. And then we we're back uh, again working with this idea from Nishida and Sasaki that there's this continuum of experience. And in the continuum of experience, uh, our selves are constantly flowing, uh, constantly changing. There's no fixed or permanent self, but there's this flowing self. So this flowing self will be will, can be it arises and disappears, arises and disappears. There's this sense of flow momentariness. And so the no person perspective is fully embodied in the present moment, whereas the God's eye view is, is kind of disembodied. We, we do this all the time to ourselves. We kind of separate from ourselves. So one example that I really want to emphasize with when I teach mindful embodiment training is when I say, um, uh, uh, be grounded in your sphere of experience. Many students will, will have an idea of what that sphere of experience is or what it looks like, but they don't actually feel it from the inside out. They're looking from the outside in. It's a great question you ask, because it, it's really a shift in perspective and bringing, bringing uh, uh, an awareness of uh, the, the being fully present and, and fully embodied in the moment as a way of exploring our experience that chose to stand in apart from it and in it. I mean, you have to do both, but normally we forget about, we're not taught about how to be in the present, fully embodied, uh, and, and, and not relating our experience to uh, a fixed sense of self-identity. Does that answer Yeah, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, that brings us to the end of our time. So it makes me to thank the um, sponsors, to Chi, um, and to thank uh, Dirk and Sarah for We'll end in this talk and of course uh, thank our speaker. Thank you very much.